Good evening, everybody. Glad that you ventured out on a snowy night. And just be praying everyone gets home safe tonight, their travels. And it is a privilege and honor to be here. We're going we're gonna to be looking in Matthew um, when we get there, chapter 16. I didn't start here when preparing for this, and, um, but this is where the Lord took me, so where we're going to be. Um, last year, New Year's Day was Sunday, on a Sunday, and I was privileged in, to, to preach on that day. I like, of all the holidays, of course, the birth of Christ, yes, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, yes. I like the idea of a new year. I like the idea of starting new. Forget the old, pressing towards the new. I like the idea of new things. And Pastor Jesse got to preach this Sunday, and that was New Year's Eve. So I again get to preach on the first time on the new year. So kind of happy about that. (laughs) But... um, Matthew 16, 24 is where we're going to go, but I, I want us to start. You, you all know the book of Nehemiah. I'm pretty sure you know about the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, uh, Jerusalem, the, the children of uh, Judah was in captivity, and, and uh, they had, a remnant had been going back. And the book of Nehemiah starts with some that came to uh, uh, Babylonia there and, and came and was talking and, and shared with um, Nehemiah, who was a Jew, how the, the city of Jerusalem was broken down, the walls were broken down, and it was still, there had been a remnant already returned, but it was still in pretty bad shape. And, and what always has caught my attention is the fact that that broke Nehemiah's heart. And the Bible says that he wept, he fasted, he prayed, and that he, he was really burdened with that. And because of that burden, it caused him to get into action. It caused him to risk, really, his own life. He was the king's cupbearer, which really was a pretty good position to be in. He lived in the palace. He lived there. He was friends with the king, albeit uh, a pagan king, but he was still there. And he got up the nerve to ask the king for permission to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city walls. And if you know the story, he did. He went back. He was uh, under all kinds of uh, pressure and stress. He, he was um, mocked for trying to rebuild the city walls. He was, uh, they wanted him to come out and meet them on the plain of Ono, which was Ono, because they would have killed him there. The, the men that were working on the walls around Jerusalem, they worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And there was great danger, but the walls were miraculously built in record time. Uh, It wouldn't have happened today in Yavapai County because you couldn't get a permit that quick. But but, uh, that's a miracle there, just that they got the walls built and ready to go. But, you know, we we focus so much on Nehemiah being, you know, he wasn't wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't uh, one of the kings. He was a leader. But he, he was leading for a time, and it was just in the rebuilding of the wall. So he's known as a great administrator, a great leader, planner, and all those things. And yes, he did all those things. And the walls of Jerusalem were built. But if you look in chapter 8, is where it starts, where Ezra, and I think this is the most important thing that we can get from the book of Nehemiah, in my mind, Ezra reads from the, the book of the law, and it starts really a revival of the people. They turn back to God and worship is reinstated and things are, are going well. And to me, that's the result God was interested in is the people returning back to the Lord. Nehemiah did the things he had to do to get the people to that place. And then the Lord was able to be worshiped again. And, uh, it, you know, it went from there into what God had really had in store. What do we know about Nehemiah? And what I find that I can compare to tonight is the fact that he was unselfish, 
the fact that he took some steps of faith, the fact that he was willing to follow even at uh, risk of his own life, and the fact that he accomplished what the Lord had for him to do. And I look at him and I think, yeah, great job. The walls were built. It's now a walled city. But look at the, the spiritual aspect of that. People are turning back to God. People are worshiping. People are doing what God wants them to do. And so I want us to look at this tonight in Matthew 16, verse 24, and realize that some of the things that we do, we may not understand or realize uh, the, the, the total message of what God has for us. As we look at those things, we may think, well, okay, I'm going to do this, but you know, uh, I, don't, I don't get what spirituality or what thing is going to come from that. But yet, whatever we do for the Lord, and we do it in the right place, the right time, and the right attitude, has benefits. And everything we do really has eternal benefits for the Lord. We don't know who might be saved, who might come to Christ, because of maybe some of the little things that we do, and some of the things that God impresses upon us to do. And tonight, we're talking about you must take up your cross. You must take up your cross. Matthew 16, starting in verse 24, and Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So we see Jesus has his disciples gathered around him. And it, I think it's more than just the 12 that were there. If you look in the, in the corresponding parallel passage in Mark 8, 34, it talks about that there was crowds also that were there. So I don't think Jesus was just saying to the 12 disciples here, I, I, you, you have to do this. You have to uh, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. I think he was talking to the crowd that was around there, which says to us that um, it's applicable to us, to everyone. Whoever hears this, you, me, whoever hears it, he was using the inclusive language. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, or if someone wishes to come after me, it's a general statement. All that want to follow Jesus Christ, it's to everyone. And he did this 2,000 years ago, but yet it's still valid for us today. And what the Lord Jesus said was he gives us three um, requirements if we're going to follow after him and not just be in name a disciple, but to be, be a disciple. Uh, Pastor Jesse on Sunday talked about Christian being really Christ follower, little Christ. Hey, to be a disciple is to be one that you follow, the teacher or the leader. And he gives us three things, and, and I really don't like it to make uh, a formula here. This is not a, you know, do these three things and you're going to be a disciple. But he gives us three things that are requirements. And what, the first one is deny ourself. Second is we must take up our cross. And third, we must follow him. And basically what Jesus is saying is you must be done with yourself and your ways. And you must be full of Jesus and his ways we got to get done with us. And then in the next three verses, 25, 26, 27, he gives us three reasons why, if we do this, following Jesus will be worth it. If we follow after him, he says, because whoever wishes to save his life, in 25, because what will a man be profited, in 26 and 27, because the Son of Man is going to come back. And so we look at these things, and we want to first I want to look at the three requirements that he gives us here, and then we'll look at the reasons of why we should want to do that. And Jesus just told his disciples before this how he was going to Jerusalem to suffer, be killed, and be raised up on the third day. So what's true of the teacher is true of the disciple. If the teacher is going to suffer and die, 
so must the disciples suffer and die. It's pretty difficult to play follow the leader if you don't follow where the leader leads. In Christianity, being a believer, following after Christ, is a game of follow the leader. Christ is the leader, and we are his disciples. We're followers. And though you know, Christ blazed the trail by suffering in Jerusalem, we and his disciples are called to do the same thing, to follow in that. All right? Pretty basic stuff. First thing he says is you must deny yourself. And the idea here is that you're done with yourself. You're done with your ways. You're done with what pleases you, your thoughts, your ambitions, your desires, all take second place to Jesus. And I want to make one thing clear. He doesn't say you can't have those desires, those ambitions. But he does say they take second place. Sometimes people want to throw this on you and just say, okay, give it all up. Well, that's what a cult does. And they tell you to drop everything and follow after some leader. We're saying you follow after Jesus Christ, you put him first. You're still going to have some things in your own life. God's not here to ruin us. He's here to help us and to uh, help us do what is, is good for us. So what matters now is not us or yourself. We denied ourselves. What matters now is the one whom we follow. We need to do like Jesus and pray the prayer that he prayed in the garden, not my will be done, but thou will be done. To deny ourself is to look to the interest of others rather than our own personal interest. To deny yourself is to have as your ambition to be pleasing to him. The kingdom of heaven is no place for self-centered, self-willed people. The kingdom of heaven is no place for those who think highly of themselves. The kingdom of heaven is no place for the proud, arrogant, self-seeking, or self-trusting person. We're to die to ourselves. I wasn't in the military. I know a few of you guys were in the military. Enlisting in the military is a a good picture of this. You sign on the dotted line to enlist. You made a commitment to deny yourself. The first step, they take you off to boot camp where you learn that you no longer matter, right? (laughs) Then the first, uh, from there, they tell you when you'll get up in the morning, when when you'll eat, what you'll eat, when you'll shower. They'll tell you when you what you will do and you will do today, and they'll t- when you're going to do it, they'll tell you how long you're going to do it. They'll tell you when to stop, and they'll tell you when you can go to bed for rest. Then after boot camp, they're going to tell you where you can go, where you're going to serve after that. Um, you do what they tell you to do, and you no longer matter. When you come to Christ, you no longer matter. What matters We made a decision to enroll with the Lord, submit our life to his leadership, and those implications really are huge. And we'll probably spend the rest of our life working those things out. So, pretty easy, right? Have you denied yourself? Have you submitted yourself to Jesus Christ? Here's the tough part. If you haven't, Are you really a disciple of Christ? I'm not asking you what prayers you prayed. I'm not asking what theology you have. I'm not asking you how consistent your church attendance is. I'm asking, have you reached an end of yourself? Matthew 5, 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit means that you have acknowledged your own spiritual bankruptcy. You have no spiritual resources within yourself. It was the sin-confessing, breastfeeding, mercy-pleading tax gatherer who Jesus said was justified in Luke 18, 13. Not the one trying to please himself. If we want to come after him, it's a life of self-denial. And I think that's pretty plain if we want to do that. Those who are still clinging to their own agenda for their own life aren't really truly following Jesus. Second requirement, 
You must take up your cross. It probably doesn't mean what it meant to them when Jesus spoke this. But the disciples and those listening would have understood just exactly what it meant. The cross was an instrument of torture and execution. The victim eventually suffocates as he becomes too exhausted to paint, too painfully lift himself up on the nails to breathe. It's been compared to drowning slowly. Crucifixion was used extensively during the times of Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, it wasn't some strange and unusual punishment that was inflicted upon him. It was the common form of execution in those days. All Pilate had to do was pronounce the sentence that Jesus was to be crucified, and Jesus would be crucified. It was very common. It happened a lot. It's interesting today, we wear crosses on our neck. We'll wear those as a symbol. We have a cross behind us. In Jesus' day, it would, it would have been like wearing a hangman's noose around your neck because the cross was a symbol of execution. But today, it's a symbol of a risen Savior. And I get that. But that cross meant somebody had to die. Somebody had to be crucified. And those that were following after him and those who were hearing what he was saying they could understand and they knew what it was to watch a criminal carry his cross from the Roman jail to the crucifixion site and there along the way be verbally abused and mocked and maybe even fall under the weight of that cross that they had to carry. So what Jesus is saying, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him take up his cross. Jesus was telling the disciples, you've got to be ready and willing to die for me. Sometimes we think, well, I'm going to take up my cross and, you know, I'm going to go to church. That's my cross I have to bear. No, that's not it. You know, I, I'm going to serve where I can. I'll, I'll do a little here and there. But what he's saying is take up your cross. Be willing to die for Jesus Christ. Guys, we're getting into an, a time when... That may not be as far-fetched as you think. Other parts of the world, there are literally people dying for the cause of Christ now, as they have done for the last 2,000 years. And the way our country is going and the way things are heading, we might be in that same boat one day in our lifetime. We may have to face the fact that to be a Christian, we've got to be willing to die for our faith, what we believe. Be willing to die for Christ. Be ready. Be willing. And sometimes it's not that dramatic or drastic that we have to give our life, but there's a lot of things that God asks us to do that in following Christ where we have to do things that aren't pleasant, aren't convenient, aren't something we really want to do, but it's something that God has called us to do, to be ready to do, and to be willing to do what he's, he tells us to do. Now, if you saw, anyone saw The Passion of the Christ, the movie a few years ago, you've probably seen it once and that was enough. <laughs> Brutal. And one of the things that, I, I, that sticks with me after seeing that was just the brutality that took place there. So when Jesus is saying, you need to be willing to die for me, take up your cross, you need to be willing to die for me. Oh, there's something else there's going to be some pain. There, there may be some mocking. There may be some physical abuse that you're going to have to take. There may be all these other things that go along with that. There's going to be some difficulty, some hardship, some ridicule. This is a picture of what Christ wants us to be aware of. You know that the 12 disciples, if you take the 11 that were left after Judas the only one that, that kind of lived a natural life and he was exiled was John. The rest died as martyrs, crucified, beaten, killed. Jesus was preparing those that are going to follow him. It's going to, it's going to get rough. What the Romans do to the Christians, they fed them to the lions for sport. Man. 
We've got it pretty easy, guys. We've got it very easy. Um, so far, we're not in a place yet where we're uh, someone standing outside our church to uh, lock us up or something. <clears throat> but you know, I pray it doesn't, but it could happen. Things like that could take place. And it's getting more and more serious that way. But Jesus is saying, you're going to be hated because of my name. You know, one of the most offensive things we can say as preachers or teachers of the word of God is there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. That offends three-fourths of the world, I think. But there's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ, and that's through serving him. And that means there's going to be some physical sufferings that we might have to go through just to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Christ, in uh, 1 Peter 2.21, and I'll, I'm going to apologize already, Diane, if I mess up here. But 1 Peter 2.21 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Wait a minute. I was called to go to church, have nice dinners before church, cookies and coffee before church. I was called to enjoy the nice inside padded chairs and, you know, we got heat. Isn't it great? You know, it's snowing outside and we're in comfortable in here. That's what I was called to. I was called to, to this is going to be good. Jesus is going to take care of all my problems. No more problems, amen? No more problems. No, he says, Peter says, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. I like the cookies and donuts, you know. <laughs> Great meal tonight. I enjoy all that. Are we ready for what may take place? Are we ready for what may happen when it really gets tough? And I'm not talking just about the, the normal things that happen in life. Listen, things are going to happen in this world. People get sick. Things happen. There's going to be those things. But are we willing to follow in the steps of Christ in his example that we may have to go through some suffering? to be a believer, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It may not always be an easy thing to do. It may not always be the thing that was going to happen. You know, in Jesus' day, <laughs> when the criminal would carry his cross to the place of execution, uh, he wasn't surprised that he was going to die. You know, we have an idea, I think, sometimes that following Christ means as I follow Christ, well, I'm going to get out of this. It's not, you know. But my point here is that as we follow Christ, just as that person carrying his cross to the crucifixion, he knew he was going to die. There was no getting out of it. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he knew that there would be pain and he would be nailed to that Christ, to that cross. Listen, we know there's going to be hardships. But we also know, and we're going to, we're going to see the blessings of this in a little bit here, but it doesn't mean everything is going to be grand, easy, fun, entertaining. It would be nice if it was that way. But it's not. So, have we taken up our cross? Luke says in Luke 9.23, it's a daily thing. We should take up our cross. When we get up in the mornings, when we get dressed, before we go out the door, we need to take up our cross and say, I'm going to follow Jesus today. If I have to suffer and die, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up my cross. The third thing he says is this. You must follow Jesus. And this is talking about the path of obedience. To come after Jesus, you need to follow him. You need to obey him. This is what he asked from us. Um, 
there was a time in the ministry of Jesus when he spoke to those who were attempting to have a Lord whom they didn't follow. And Jesus said in, in uh, Luke 6, 46, did I miss that one? Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm sorry, Diane. <laughs> why do you, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Why are you saying, oh, I'm a believer, I, I, I love Jesus, I'm going to follow him, but you don't follow and obey what he's telling you to do. You cannot have a Lord that you do not obey. It doesn't work. Right? Boy, there, we had two kinds of cake tonight. Amen? You're not going to remember anything else I said, but we had two kinds of cake. When you go home, you're going to remember that. I like, I like sweets. I like cake. I like food. You can tell. But, you know, here's the thing. You can't have a dessert that's not fattening. You can't go swimming without getting wet. You can't live without breathing. It's impossible. And it's impossible to have a Lord that you're, he's not the master and you're not willing to obey him. God desires an obedient people. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them to obey. After the Ten Commandments were read to the people of Israel, in Exodus 24, 7, the people pledged, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. But they weren't. When they proved they were just words, the Lord let them die in the wilderness. If you ever read in the book of Judges, you're going to see a lot of things that displease the Lord. There's a lot of things that happen in the book of Judges. It's kind of a, sometimes kind of depressing to read. But this is where Judges 21, 25 comes in. Yes. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's not obedience. That's doing what you want to do. That's doing the way you want to do it. The prophets always called the people of Israel to come back and follow the Lord in obedience. In Isaiah 1.18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now, let us reason, said the Lord. Jesus says this. It was true then, it's true in Jesus' time, it's true, it's true today. Jesus is calling his, his people back to the Lord, back to the way that God wants it to go. Jesus said in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. Teaching them to look at the words. Teaching them to learn a few songs. Teaching them to uh, kind of go through the motions of it all. He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching them to be obedient to Jesus Christ. That's always been the heart of God. That we follow God. That we're obedient to God. That we follow after him. So, Third question I have for you, are you following Jesus? Do you follow where Jesus leads? Are you following after him? Because you can't sit on the fence. You can't follow Jesus half-heartedly. He says in Luke 20, 11, 23, he was not with me, is against me. You've got to follow, and you've got to follow the right way. Suppose I invited you to my house, you didn't know where I lived, and I said, well, just follow me. And we start down the road, and I turn, and you say, yeah, I don't want to turn here. And you go your way, and you don't know where I'm going, and I keep going my way. Are you really following me? No. Are you going to get to my place? Probably not. But if you're following after the Lord, you're going to follow him on every turn, whichever way he wants you to go. So... Are we following? Are we willing to deny ourselves, take up our cross, 
and follow the Lord. Well, I know that can be kind of a tough thing. And I know it can actually be kind of hard. And I think sometimes we get caught up in these things and we realize, and don't realize what's going on and how it's happening. Sometimes we think, and you can listen to this and listen to what I'm saying, and you may think, well, you know, that's, that's pretty legalistic what you're saying. That's a, is that a works religion that you're talking about? Is it all about works? Is it all about what I'm going to do? No. I think there's grace here. It's not a work salvation. I think what I said is what Jesus said, consistent with his words. And I think sometimes we have, um, you know, we've tried to, to say, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of works, lest any man should boast. I think we've looked at that. I think sometimes we said, well, you can be a believer and not really be a disciple. I'm not sure if that really is what Jesus is meaning here. I'm pretty sure he's not what he's meaning. And I think some would say, well, yeah, but that's, we live in the grace of God. So we have the grace of God and we can be saved, but not really be following, not really denying ourselves, not really willing to sacrifice but we can still be saved. And, and I'm going to say, that's, that's really not what the Lord's saying here. And what he's telling us here is that <clears throat> this is not works. This is not legalism. This is what truly uh, the grace of God is all about. When, a, when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, that is really the first instance of the grace of God. Why is, how's that the grace of God? He kicked them out. He didn't kill them. He could have been said, no, we're done. But the grace of God says, I'm going to give you more chances here. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you live. And it's the same thing, I believe, with us, is that we look at this, and if we look at it solely from, well, this is works, this is hard, I can't do this, we forget that the grace of God is going to be there to help us do this, to get through it. It is the cults of this world that say you've got to do this, 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 and this, and that's all, you know, just follow after us, do those things. But God is saying, you can't do this without my grace, is basically what he's saying. Um, grace is all over this. All right, how do I know this? <laughs> I, think, I think you're like me, aren't you? I'm self-centered. Anybody? I'm self-centered. I, I want what's best for me. So do you. And you may be able to do certain things, but you can't keep that up all the time. And I'm going to tell you, it is the grace of God that says I can deny myself and follow after Jesus. Only through the grace of God. Because you can only do that for so long. And then you're going to fall on your face. But with the grace of God, the Holy Spirit of God in your life, you can deny yourself and follow after him. Because we're all self-centered. You know? Came to church one Sunday and there weren't many cookies. But I stayed. Right? Church is more than the cookies, right? I know I talk a lot about that, but it's because it's I'm self-centered. None of us really want to die. None of us want to suffer. The only way you'll ever desire to take up that cross is if God's grace is working in your life. I pray we never get to that point where we have to make that decision. I pray we're never put in that situation where we have to make a stand for Christ or they're going to take our life. I hope that doesn't happen in our country and in this world. But if it does, the only way we can make that stand is through the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I, want, I like to think I can do that. But in my strength, <laughs> I'm as much a coward as anybody. But through the grace of God, I can make those kinds of stands. Right, amen? Because through the grace of God and through what God is putting into our life and telling us to do, that's how we can suffer. That's how we can take up our cross because he's working in us. And that's how we follow after Jesus. How many of you are perfect? I have two daughters. I think they're perfect. They're not, but I think they are. I like to think I can be perfect, but I'm not. None of us are perfect. We mess up. We say things. We get upset. We get mad. We get angry about things. We do stupid things because we're not perfect. But through the grace of God, we are going to follow Jesus as perfectly as we can through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? You're going to make mistakes. And you're going to, the Holy Spirit's going to get a hold of you and you're going to say, why did I do that? You did it because you're not perfect. But we're going to strive our best through the grace of God and through the Holy Spirit. We're going to strive our very best to do the very best that we can, knowing full well. And you know who else knows full well we're going to fail? God does. God knows we're going to fail. And yet we're going to continue on striving towards this perfection, pleading for his grace to help us, Repenting where we, when we fail and trusting his grace that we can actually follow after Jesus Christ. I can perfectly follow the Lord in my imperfection. Does that make sense? Doesn't to me either, but I can do that, right? I can follow him perfectly in my imperfections because of who he is and because of the grace of God. And that's how we have to go. That's how we live this life. This is not legalism. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's not legalism. That's not work salvation. That is just drenched in the grace of God. God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows you can, you'll fail. God knows you'll struggle with denying yourself. God knows you'll struggle with following after him. God knows you really don't want to pick up that cross sometimes. God already knows that. And his grace is all over that to say, come on, you can. Come on. Keep trying. Take those steps. Keep trying. But I messed up. Come on. Keep following. Keep coming after me. You know, you know I, Lord, I just got so angry. That's all right. Come on. Confess that, move on, move on. And let me tell you one thing. If you mess up, you hear it from me, if you mess up, don't you quit coming to church. If you mess up, you need to be here. If you mess up, you need to be around believers. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. When you mess up, we're all messed up too. <laughs> We've already made our mistakes. You know, my testimony is, is pretty simple. I've never drank in my life. Got saved when I was nine years old. Nine years old. That was a few years ago. <laughs> Came to Christ, never drank, never did drugs. Never did. Got in, I have my own sins. I'm not perfect. People sometimes think, Wow, how did you do that? I don't know. The grace of God, I don't know. I never really had those desires. But I have my own sins, right? I'm not perfect. 
I know you think I am, but I'm not. I'm not even close. And just because I've never drank or did drugs doesn't mean I'm in perfection. Just because you have doesn't mean you're doomed in imperfection. It's the grace of God that gets us through. It's the grace of God. Without God's grace, I'm a sinner doomed for hell. Without the grace of God, all of us are. Well, big sins, little sins, it's all sin. We're all sinners saved by grace. And it's the grace of God that that keeps us going and keeps us moving. If you have a heart, a desire to follow after Jesus Christ, you do it by the grace of God. You do it through the grace of God. This is really the gospel. This is really it. We're not worthy. We're sinners. We're worthless. We have no righteousness. We're imperfect. And God says, yeah, I want you. I want you to come to me. I've got a better way than what you're doing. I was talking to someone, I don't even remember who now, but I was talking to someone this week about the fact that I've been around a lot of the um, AA and NA people <clears throat> for the last 10 or 15 years. <clears throat> been around just kind of on the outside in the meetings that were going on there. And one of the things I found, because they would come and talk to me as pastor, they'd come and ask me different things. And they all had this attitude, for the most part, most of them had this attitude, God was against them. God hated them. Because they had all these bad things going on in their life. God must hate them. And it's like, no, God's not the one that hates you. God's not the one bringing all the bad things. That's the devil. He's the one that's trying to destroy you. God's not trying to destroy you. God's trying to build you. God says, I'm going to take your worthless life, my worthless life. I'm going to give you the grace of my grace in your life, and you're going to make it. You're going to make it. And you can do it because of God's grace in your life. So why? Why do we want to follow after him? Why do we want to do this? Real quickly, he's got three reasons that we we want to do. First one is verse 25. He says, For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Because of our life. We struggle, we, we search, we go after all the wrong things in this world. Amen? We search for all the bad stuff. We think this is going to satisfy us. We think more cars, more money, bigger houses, all these things are going to be what we need. And we think this is what it's all about. This is life. If more I can get. Well, that is that self-centered life that we've been talking about. And Jesus is basically saying, listen, if you want real life, I've got real life for you. I've got the real thing. I've got a changed life that's going to make you a better person in your life. I've got a life that you can't compare. And if you'll do these things, you'll gain life better than you've ever had it. I know everyone here is saved, but would you want to go back to the life you used to have? Would you want to go back to that? Would you want to give up what you have now and you say, well, I don't have a whole lot. Well, you got Jesus, man. Would you want to go back to that stuff? It's like a dog returning to his own vomit, is what the Bible says, basically. We know that if we'll give our life to Christ, we'll gain our life. We'll gain. You know what? I think that's a pretty good deal. Give me, give Christ my life. He's going to give me a richer, fuller life. And I'll be able to live. And I'll be able to do what God wants me to do. We think about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had everything in this life, but he lost eternity. Zacchaeus was another man that was very rich. But he went the other way. 
And he gave, he lost his life, and Jesus gained that life. Jesus told him today, salvation has come to your house. One was lost for eternity, one gained his life. He may have lost this life on this earth, but he kept it for all eternity. Judas refused to take up his cross and follow. He betrayed the Lord, 30 pieces of silver. Jesus even said it would have been good for him if he had not been born. All the martyrs that have lived and given their life have gained eternal life through Jesus Christ. One of my favorite accounts in the scriptures is when the, uh, the rich young ruler, when he came to Jesus, he came seeking eternal life. And when Jesus told him what it would cost him with his life and riches here, the Bible says he went away grieved and refused to follow Jesus. Went away grieved. Went away sorrowful. Because he was not willing to follow after the Lord. Moses, in Hebrews 11.25, we have that one? There it is. Moses, the Bible says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Moses figured it out. There's more to gain in following Jesus than settling for a little bit here and now. Settling for the the best the world has, and that's not much. Verse 26 says, for the second reason, for what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Man, if you had everything in this world, if you had all the money, you had all this billions and billions of dollars you could do anywhere, live anywhere, go anywhere, and you had all that, and you died, and you spent an eternity in hell, what would you trade? What would you be willing to give in exchange for your soul? There's a couple of people in the scriptures <clears throat> that kind of chose to live this way. Solomon was a rich man, intelligent man. He pursued pleasure. He pursued alcohol. He pursued material wealth. He pursued entertainment. He pursued sexual pleasure. And then in Ecclesiastes 2.10, he said, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. And then in Ecclesiastes 1-2, he said, all is vanity. It's all worthless. You can gain it all, and you'll get nothing. What do you want to give in exchange? What do you want to give in exchange for your own soul and, and being happy and being in, in love with Jesus Christ? What will we change for that? What's it worth to us? One day we'll be on that deathbed, and we're going to find out what's important to us. In Psalm 90, 12, it says, Teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And the last reason, in verse 27, says, For the Son of Man has come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. There's going to be a day of judgment. There's coming a day when you will stand before Jesus Christ. And he will look at you in your life and evaluate it according to your deeds. He will return it to you. Recompense means to give back. If your deeds were self-centered, you're going to face condemnation. But if your deeds were Christ-centered, Christ-directed, you'll receive mercy. Are we willing to forsake our life? and cling to Jesus Christ. Really cling to him. Listen, our only hope is clinging to Christ. 
our only hope is following after Jesus Christ. I hope you don't go away tonight thinking, well, this, is, this was a tough message. This was hard to understand. This was something I don't know. You know, this seems too hard to do. God is not asking you <clears throat> to do foolish, crazy things. He's asking you to put him first in your life. He's asking you to say everything else is second place, but I've got to be number one. He's asking you to say, listen, you can deny yourself, you can take up your cross, you can follow after me, and you can still enjoy your life. Amen? Is any of you not enjoying life? You've been saved? You know Jesus? Are you not enjoying? Isn't it a better way to go? Isn't it better to say, Lord, it's you, it's not me, I, I can't, I want to live my life this way. And there's, here's, the, here's the whole thing, and I'll, I'll stop here. The world doesn't understand this. The unsaved, the non-believers, they don't know, they don't get it. They think, man, you're going down to that church, what for? You're putting money in the offering, what for? You're, you're, you're following this Bible that's 2,000 years old, it's outdated, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? I, I started this message, and uh, I ended, it started in Nehemiah, but I started with the idea, and this is where it all started. I thought, there's no earthly reason why I'm a Christian. There's no earthly reason why. Science says, there's no God. People all around will tell you, oh, well, if there's a God, he's not a, he doesn't care. There's no earthly reason why I'm saved, but I'm going to tell you why I'm saved. Because there is a God in heaven. There was a man, Jesus Christ, that lived, died, and rose again. People say, well, have you seen him? Well, I know he's there, right? I felt him. There is nothing that can change a person's heart except Jesus Christ in your life. You can try anything you want. God makes a difference. God makes a difference. Jesus changes hearts. I've seen over and over and over again. There's no earthly reason why you're here tonight except Jesus Christ. He's the only reason. And I, I just, I hope you can go away tonight thinking, I'm going to do it through the grace of God. I'm going to make it. I want to be what God wants me to be. Amen? Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you, you do make a way for us. You help us in spite of ourselves, Lord, when we, we don't know why even where to go and what to do. We thank you for that, Lord. And Father, I just pray your word goes forth. You tell us your word will not return void. My words are meaningless, Lord. Your word is everything. May you just speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name.